Um, so my name is Jeremy Nixon. I'm from the Spark Technology Center, and I'm here to present some work on core deep learning inside of MLlib, that is, inside of Spark. This is um, a sort of continuation of work that I've been doing, but um, the short is I graduated in applied math and CS at Harvard and went to the Spark Technology Center to contribute to machine learning. And so I've mostly been working inside of MLlib. I'm the author of the Deep Neural Network Regression Algorithm in MLlib. Um, and this is really about increasing the ability for data scientists to access deep learning inside of MLlib. So the current API um, has been extended, and uh, that is like one of the major aspects of um, what we had planned to do uh, about six months ago. So this slide is from a presentation that I gave at uh, Apache Big Data about six months ago. Um, so we had just finished you know, deep neural networks for regression and wanted to expand the opportunities for deep learning in Spark to convolutional neural networks, um, have a more flexible deep learning API. That is, the API that we had was um, extraordinarily high level to the point where you didn't have the flexibility to build the type of model that you'd like. And so we wanted to introduce a substantially better API, um, introduce more modern optimizers, so take advantage of the ability to do um, sort of adaptive gradients and take a sort of rolling moving average of your learning rate, and you'll sort of see in this presentation um, how that improves performance over time. Um, and also add more modern activations, drop out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this presentation is mostly about the completion of most of this content. So I've um, implemented convolutional neural networks inside of MLlib. Um, we now have a flexible deep learning API, modern optimizers, um, and I'll show you the details and give you access. Um, so the structure of this talk is going to open with framing deep learning. Um, that is, how do we think about it from the perspective of a machine learning engineer who's actually implementing the algorithms, um, but also a data scientist who wants to apply it to some new computer vision or audio or language processing task, um, or from the perspective of a software engineer who um, wants to build an efficient parallel system for distributing this computation. Um, second, there's this API that we created um, that's at what I would call sort of the just right space. So there's this sort of like overly high level API where you'll have a one liner for your entire deep learning algorithm, which doesn't let you express enough to capture whatever structure your particular problem has. Um, there's this sort of intermediate representation which you'll see in libraries like Keras or wrappers over TensorFlow or Torch. Um, and they basically allow you to specify the layer types um, and hyperparameters for those particular layers. And then you have quite low level APIs like Theano or like TensorFlow, where you really have a numerical compute system and you end up writing a lot of boilerplate to tie things together. Um, but it makes a lot of sense if you are coming at it from the perspective of a researcher um, who actually needs low level control to implement new types of layer or activation um, or fiddle with the optimization itself. Um, so afterwards, we'll talk about optimization and this sort of new and improved deep learning system. Um, we introduced a suite of optimizers, and so we'll show you comparisons of performance and talk about how those optimizers actually work. Um, and finally, we'll look at performance of the system, um, sort of how did we implement the distributed compute, and um, basically what is the plan for the future. So I guess what are we going to implement in order to speed things up, in order to make things more accurate, in order to integrate with more systems that everybody wants to be using. Um, so first, framing convolutional neural networks. I'm gonna start with talking about structural assumptions that the algorithm makes and how that leads to uh, an event, a much better ability to model vision data, um, audio data, natural language data, um, really sensory processing. Um, talk about automated feature engineering and how we accomplish that with backpropagation. And then talk about learning representations and how much flexibility that gives you um, when you're doing natural language processing or computer vision to basically represent some body of data in a way that's much easier to predict on top of. Um, and finally, we'll look at applications. Um, so one of the first structural assumptions that you get with neural networks generally and with convolutional neural networks um, is this combinatorial flexibility. So one reason that people are so excited is basically it allows you to posit many, many possible models um, by combining your features in um, many, many possible ways and then using extraordinary amounts of data um, to take the huge number of possible hypotheses and reduce the space down to a point where um, you can actually basically fit the model really cleanly. Um, and so the way that you get depth 
um, is sort of explained here. So basically, you'll have um, a body of inputs, and you'll combine those inputs in dynamic ways to get a hidden layer, and then you can combine the, the, the features at that hidden layer in dynamic ways to get yet another hidden layer and another until you end up with an output node. Um, and at e with each layer, you end up with combinations of features or combinations of combinations of features, and so on and so forth, um, which gives you that extraordinary flexibility that I was talking about earlier. Um, so this is a sort of short body of structural assumption of the model. Um, so basically, you'll have input nodes, which are your features, and the operations for doing feed-forward uh, propagation is pretty straightforward. So uh, you actually see a few code snippets from the Scala code running in Spark here. Um, we basically, in order to predict an output, um, we'll just multiply our first layer by a body of weights. Um, and so you can see that uh, weights are represented by W, and the data is represented by X. Um, so you end up with a matrix multiply between X and W, and you can see that in the first um, forward pass map code. Um, then there's this nonlinear activation, um, which allows you to capture a structure um, that's somewhat more complex. So basically, we put it through what's called a ReLU, um, or we take the max of zero and the next value, and that lets us um, basically use that nonlinearity to, to basically increase the flexibility of the model um, in, in a fairly dynamic way. And you can see the ReLU in the sort of bottom code example. Um, but what we get out of layering this is, is a body of hierarchical abstractions. And, and what that means is that um, when you can combine features dynamically and then optimize it, like back to front, um, you're going to learn features that are optimal at each level of representation for predicting your output. And the thing that happens to come out of this, so if you have data that's vision data or audio data, um, you'll end up with a representation that's hierarchical because um, that, uh, that structure is what's found in the data and the neural network is flexible enough to learn that structure directly from the data. And so you'll end up with, in the first layer, um, things that can be combined in order to get the second layer representation, and at the second layer, things that can be combined in order to get the third level representation that ends up being an optimal representation so that it's linearly separable at the final layer. Um, and Zeller and Fergus uh, have a technology called deconvolution, which they implemented, um, and this is actually from an ImageNet winning paper in 2013, but um, it actually lets you visualize um, what those more basic and then more complex uh, levels of feature are. And so you can see it going from pixels to edges to shapes to parts and to objects. Um, and none of this was hard-coded. It's all learned directly from the data. So basically, if you give it a number of outputs and say, optimize for these outputs, it'll find internal representations of the data that can be combined dynamically to, um, to generate the output accurately. Um, and you can actually sort of see how as it gets deeper into the network, it gets closer to the actual images. And so um, the concept of transfer learning, which is saying, you know, can we take a network that was trained on one body of data and train it more efficiently on another body of data by reusing the combinations at a lower level um, becomes visually clear. And so when you train a ConsNet, say, on vision data for multiple tasks, you end up with very similar low-level representations. And one super simple way to speed up the training of a model like this um, is to realize that since the, the bottom layered representations are shared between tasks, um, you can cut off the higher level content, that is, the things that are closer. So this is trained on ImageNet, and you can see that as you get deeper in the network because the actual structure of the images from ImageNet starts to come out. But um, if you want something that's more generic to the types of image that you would see in reality, um, cutting those layers and then retraining those on whatever your data set happens to be, whatever your computer vision application happens to be, is extremely effective. So there's also this um, really valuable like, asset to convolution, which is a location invariance. So in general in machine learning, you have a feature set that's fairly static. And so if you want to learn on top of an image, um, you'll have to find a feature at every single point in the image. So say you fed you know, a convolutional neural network a number of picture of planes. It would have to learn you know, what the wings look like and what the tip look like at every single part of the image if you were feeding it into logistic regression or if you were feeding it into a random forest or into a gradient booster. So it couldn't actually differentiate between the same object being at different locations in an image. Or if you think of an audio stream, you have a time series and you may not actually 
um, want to have to learn, you know, what frequency maps to, say, what instrument um, at every single time step. You'd like it to basically realize that, you know, this is the frequency generated by a trombone or by a flute, um, no matter where it was. And so um, convolutional neural networks restrict the space of features that can be combined um, to a locality. So it'll only look at a particular segment of the image, um, usually a square. And so that will basically force the network to say, okay, well, here this thing is close together, here this thing is close together, and um, we can combine things that are like locationally close um, into higher level things. And so um, that basically allows you to save huge amounts of computation um, so that you can use the exact same feature set over your entire image. Um, that is, your feature will be a small kernel that'll capture some aspect of the audio stream or of the image, and then you can generalize to other images by basically sliding that feature uh, filter over the entire image or over the entire audio stream or over the entire representation of language. Um, and so this is also uh, an important part of why we're getting such good performance in sort of sensory perception. So you get this location invariance property in some data sets but not in others. So you can imagine you know, coming with a data set that's you know, asking to make recommendations about products based on something that you pulled in from the web and um, having a very different type of structure to the data. So that location invariance isn't gonna be nearly as valuable when the data points that you have, the features that you have, aren't intimately related with one another. Um, and the interactions between them aren't going to be around location, they'll be around some other aspect of the data. And ideally you would find the sort of structural assumptions in the, that data and generate an algorithm that understood those assumptions in a way that it could assume it and sort of reduce the space of models that it searches over sufficiently to generalize like this. Um, so, in general, there is this, this is a very hard feature engineering task that you can kind of get at in the tabular data set setting by, like, thinking about what the feature means and looking at features and saying, you know, um, if we combine this and this or this with that, we'd expect to get better performance. Um, but as soon as you get into, say, computer vision where there's an extraordinarily large feature space where the small feature spaces will have, say, 800 or 900 or 1,000 features in them, and there will be combinations of many, many, many of those features that are relevant. And in general, it's the interactions between those features that are relevant to your model much more than the features individually. Um, you're basically faced with a feature engineering task that's almost impossible to do manually. And so one of the great advantages of structuring the network this way is that you can learn the features directly from the data and do um, a lot of the work that a data scientist would have to spend tons of time sort of manually figuring out what interacts with what um, automatically. And so this basically represents a new way to do machine learning. Instead of spending huge amounts of time engineering your features, which you would do with a tabular data set, um, you actually just structure your algorithm such that it can generate those features efficiently for itself. Um, so the final way to think about this is in terms of learning a representation. So in general, um, at the end of your neural network, you will have a linear model, like logistic regression or like linear regression. And the goal of the rest of the network is to find a representation of the data that it's really easy for that final algorithm to separate. And so one of the values to these internal representations, which you could sort of see visualized earlier, um, is that they're often better representations of the data than the data themselves, and you can move them around flexibly. And so one thing that you'll discover with computer vision models is that if you take the representation of data deeper in the network, you can learn on top of it, or you can take it out and use it in some other context, and it'll still have meaning. Um, so there's a technique in natural language processing where um, you basically use the context around a word to generate a vector that represents every word in a corpus. Um, and that representation of the word is much, much more useful than you know, one hot encoding the word um, or, you know, trying to come up with a representation of the word yourself. Um, so you can use these networks to learn a representation, and that rich representation can let you do transfer learning to some other model. Um, and it's been really essential in making progress in natural language processing. Um, and so this mode of thinking leads you know, data scientists and researchers um, to very different types of model. So the uh, convolutional neural networks and long short-term memory networks, and in general RNNs, have been extraordinarily successful recently. Um, and so here's a short list of the applications. Um, basically, we're getting state-of-the-art performance in object recognition, in object localization, um, image segmentation, restoration. And 
what that means con concretely in computer vision is since you had um, a very fast increase in our ability to solve problems in computer vision, um, there's a huge number of really like sort of valid business cases that open up um, much more quickly than people expected. So when you get gradual progress, um, you know, people tend to um, expect that ideas have been tried before, um, but as soon as there's extraordinarily fast progress, a huge number of opportunities open up simultaneously. Um, and this is fairly abstract, but you, you know that when you can do object localization, it'll you know, apply to a self-driving car when it's figuring out where a pedestrian is in an image, um, or if you're like, trying to model people in a store and are looking at where they're going, or you have some customer and you want to understand um, you know, at an emotional level how are they interacting with your advertising. Um, in general, this opens up um, a huge space of possible applications. And the creativity of the people who are applying these models um, has been demonstrated over the past few years. But um, the ability to do computer vision is, is really changing things. And you know, you're starting to see video applications. So in real time, you can you know, monitor how people are responding, how is an audience responding to a speaker, that sort of thing. Um, so recurrent neural networks and long short term memory networks have also been critical. So they're state of the art in speech recognition, um, in question answering, in machine translation. And if you look at how humans tend to represent information, um, we put it in text fairly often, and our ability to analyze that text, come up with good representations of that text, um, and act on those representations is, is like, likely to dramatically improve in the future. And that's actually much more powerful than computer vision in a sense. So in a lot of ways, there's been an explosion in the pe number of people working on computer vision because convolutional neural networks work so well on it. Um, and there's this sort of rising tide in natural language processing um, where you, know, you sort of realize that huge amounts of intellectual work um, is being done over natural language um, on generating natural language, so you know, people generating text based on data that they saw, um, on consuming it and making some sort of decisions and improving our ability to represent natural language has been really useful as well. Um, so you're getting state-of-the-art performance in question and answering, which is sort of still in twice space, but machine translation, you're getting state-of-the-art, and that has impacts on lots of people, so doing real-time translation, um, you know, you're interacting with people from around the world, you can do it in real time if you have, um, you know, some device in your ear that automatically does the translation, um, it really opens up cultures. There's um, text summarization, um, which has a lot of valuable, like, business cases and, you know, people are generating language, um, you can do sentiment analysis and trade off that data. So there, there are huge, like, broad, broad scope of applications and it really feels limited more by the creativity of the people creating these systems than the technology itself. Um, so, what we've introduced to MLlib is this more flexible API, and so this gives you um, a very clean example of how that works. So, um, you just have to load in MLlib, and this will um, basically give you access to a, basic, a body of layer types. And the layer types here are convolution, um, activation functions, max pooling functions, and they let you tie them together in flexible ways. So you can add them in whatever order you like, and a lot of the progress in, um, in computer vision early was really finding better ways of structuring these layers so that you end up with um, a network that can learn really well. So a lot of the transition between, um, say, Alex Krzyzewski's, like 2012 ImageNet winning paper um, and Zeller Fergus um, was realizing that you know, shrinking the convolution was reasonable, um, and you know, realizing that there would be interactions between the convolution deeper in the network um, allowed these sort of smaller receptive fields to grow large as you got deep into the network. And so um, basically this allows you to flexibly play with the structure of your network. And so here you see you know, a fairly deep convolutional neural network. You can use different activation functions. Um, you're using a softmax in the end because we happen to be doing classification. Um, and you basically call model.fit, and fit will run an optimizer. In this case, we're running Atom. Um, but this is all running in MLlib, so some, the same infrastructure that you run logistic regression on or a random forest on, um, using you know, NetLab Blast for the linear algebra. Um, but it'll integrate cleanly with like, all of the MLlib APIs, that is the pipeline API. Um, and so this can fit right into your like, MLlib workflow. So if you're already using it, um, it's an easy extension. And there's... Um, a lot of value to having an API that's at this level. So basically you want um, an API that's high level enough that you can efficiently um, sort of set out your code. You don't want it to be too expansive. Uh, a lot of people have been like, sort of frustrated with Cafe's like extraordinarily large text files. Um, and with TensorFlow you end up writing a lot of boilerplate and like trying to reuse things or writing functions to try to reuse things efficiently. Um, 
but you also want the API to be you know, low level enough that you can express whatever it is that you want to express. And there's a pretty big split in terms of you know, what a researcher wants versus what a data scientist wants um, from this technology. And this is really geared towards data scientists who have a particular use case and want to flexibly adapt the algorithm to their use case, um, but aren't necessarily interested in messing with the internals. Um, so Andre Karpathy talks about how hoping that TensorFlow would standardize code, but it's so low level um, that people ended up creating all sorts of different frameworks on top of it. Um, so this type of API that, is, that we have is actually fairly similar to Keras, and we'll be able to integrate with Keras. Um, but people have you know, all sorts of ways to get higher level over TensorFlow. It's, it's sort of entertaining. Um, so the nice thing about deep learning is that you get um, modularity of parts. So what you've seen thus far is convolutional layers, um, dense layers, activation functions. And since you have logistic regression at the end of your deep learning algorithm, um, you can actually just cut out the layers in internally, and you can get logistic regression um, in that bottom like, bit of code by just having a dense layer and a softmax immediately. Um, you can also just get a for feed forward neural network by combining a dense layer with just a real activation function and another dense layer. So you can basically flexibly construct different algorithms depending on what layer types you're using um, at different points in the network. And all of it runs immediately. So it's just up to you to decide how you want to structure your algorithm. Where do you want to use convolution? Where do you want to use you know, a dense like linear combination? Um, what type of activation do you want to use? Uh, it's fairly straightforward and flexible. Um, so when we've basically introduced two new layer types, convolution and max pooling, um, that both impose like fairly strong prior on the data. Um, so here's a bit on optimization. So there's um, a number of algorithms in Spark for optimization, but there's no general optimization sort of abstract API. And so um, originally we had gradient descent and LBFGS. Um, and we thought it was important to improve the training. So here you see a comparison between the top, which is stochastic gradient descent, um, and the bottom, which is Nesterov momentum. Um, so this optimizer, as, as you can see, sort of substantially improved performance. So on the x-axis, um, you have the number of iterations that the algorithm is run for. On the y-axis, you have the accuracy of the algorithm on this task. Um, so with momentum, you end up doing a lot of intelligent work um, with the way that the network is optimized. So as soon as you're sort of drawing gradients and gradient descent, um, you're gonna get some noise because you're going to be looking at stochastic subsamples of the data. And that subsample could be biased in one direction or another. Um, and what you really want is to estimate the entire gradient, but you don't wanna have to look at every single data point in your data set to do that because usually you're operating on a massive data set. Um, so what Momentum does is looks at previous gradients and assumes that the noise is going to cancel itself out. So you'll draw one batch, it'll be you know, overly weighted to one class, you'll draw another batch, it'll be overweighted to a different class. Um, the signal in that gradient is what is consistent between many gradients over time. And so by taking this basically exponentially weighted moving average of the gradient, you end up with a much faster optimization process um, than if you just take noisy gradients and add them in. And so we introduced this new optimizer and got substantially better um, like accuracy over time. So accuracy in the end, and also it's a much faster training process, so it's really helpful. Um, this is another adaptive algorithm that we introduced. So here's stochastic gradient descent versus RMS prop, um, which has this adaptive learning rate. So one major challenge in implementing these algorithms is, um, you know, how should we make sure that our hyperparameters are gonna work for our task? And one way to make that process a lot easier is by automating the process of choosing the hyperparameters inside of the algorithm. And so we started to see these adaptive learning rate algorithms. So learning rate is one of the most important parameters. And the question is, what can we learn about what the learning rate should be inside of the training process itself? And RMS prop happens to basically smooth the learning process by saying that if your learning rate is extraordinarily small early in training, um, then make it larger later in training, and vice versa. So basically look at the size of your gradients. That is, how much has this particular um, feature been changing over time? And if it's a lot, make it smaller, and if it's small, make it larger. And the effect that that has is it basically makes your features uh, more equally important to one another. So your data, for arbitrary reasons, will have 
you know, somewhat large numbers or somewhat small numbers. Like take image data where you have pixels that go from zero to 255, um, and the value will be literally larger if it's, you know, 255 instead of zero. But the structure that you tend to care about is, um, you know, like what is the actual color of this thing more than what is the size of the number. And so RMS Prop does a really good job of changing the learning rate so that it basically makes different types of color in this context equivalent to one another um, over time by seeing how large those values are and, and making the gradient react to that. So we have a distributed optimization setup um, where we have a parallel implementation of Backprop that allows um, basically a body of workers to get the weights from the master um, each worker will compute a gradient on the data that it happens to have. Um, so they're all sort of doing stochastic gradient descent. And then they send those gradients back to the master um, and average the gradient to update the weights. So it's a fairly straightforward distributed optimization process. It's uh, also what Spark will do if you're doing you know, logistic regression or linear regression. Um, and this sort of weight averaging um, thing is just sort of very elegant and, and fast and easy to implement. So there are a number of other sort of distributed optimization techniques. Um, you can, say, do all reduce where you have um, the weights separated on the workers instead of all being on the central node, um, and they all sort of dynamically update uh, one another. And you have basically a peer-to-peer -peer sharing network which says, you know, what, uh, like, worker one is responsible for these weights, worker two is responsible for those weights, um, and you communicate with one another to say, you know, um, update at a time. Um, but it turns out to be like fairly hard to implement like in the structure of MLLib. Um, and so this is a nice sort of elegant way to get stochastic gradient descent working in parallel. Um, this is synchronous, and there, there are advantages to synchronous when you um, basically cut off uh, workers at some point in time. So one downside, one obvious downside to doing synchronous gradient descent is, is you have to wait for all of the workers to return in order to update. And one thing you can do is basically say, you know, um, here's some number of workers that we're not going to wait for, so you cut off any process um, that happens after a, an amount of time, um, and just take whatever gradients you happen to have gotten up to that point. Um, and so you can run synchronous gradient descent substantially faster because lagging workers end up being the ones that, you know, uh, drag your time down substantially. So um, Alex Ulanov did a benchmark comparing this distributed CPU implementation um, to a GPU that was running CAFE on single node. Um, so we used the parallel multi-layer perceptron on Spark um, and we found that, you know, in general, the advantage to parallelism just diminishes because there's communication between the workers. Um, but we got close to equivalent um, speed to the GPU once we had scaled Spark up to seven nodes. Um, and then once we had scaled past 20 nodes, we stopped seeing improvements to adding additional workers. Um, but if you want to see more details on that benchmark, you can go to Ulanov there. Um, finally, so you can get immediate access to this um, in this GitHub directory in Spark DL um, or on Spark packages. Uh, it's fairly straightforward to download and to run. Um, and we are basically in the process of deciding um, you know, how we want to implement the autoencoder in Spark, um, about how we want to maintain these APIs over the long term. Um, but this is how you can get quick access to it if you want to use this high-level API in MLLib and you're already using MLLib in development. So um, future work includes GPU acceleration. Um, so there's another group at IBM that's working on um, basically GPU accelerating MLLib. And so they have a GPU accelerated logistic regression algorithm and, and know how to move data somewhat efficiently from uh, the cluster to the GPU. And so because of the way that we've structured um, this API, that is, you have a number of layer types and you have them interact with one another, um, because it mimics the way that QDNN can structure their API, um, instead of calling the Spark implementation of, say, convolution or of max pooling, um, you can instead call the GPU version of it. And so you won't actually have to change your code. There's basically like a line that lets you switch to the GPU. And you can use the, um, the, the API as a way to represent your algorithm and then actually run that code on the GPU instead of on your CPU cluster um, in order to get a speed up. Um, one really important aspect of this is that the API is also close enough to Keras uh, that you'll be able to integrate with it. So if you have a model that's been basically trained on a backend that's you know, in TensorFlow or CNTK or MXNet or Theano, um, 
if you run that through Keras, which is our wrapper on top of all of those libraries, um, you can basically import or export it into this library. And so if you want to do transfer learning on top of your Spark cluster or people are working in different environments, um, it, it would be fairly easy to move between one and, one and the other just using model save and load. Um, residual layers are extremely important. So um, in computer vision, in like 2014, a team from Microsoft um, blew away ImageNet using residual layers. And so that's the obvious next step for this library is to, to implement the ability to do that. Um, there's a lot of hardening that we're going to do, um, as well as regularization, batch normalization, um, adding tensor support. Um, that library actually already exists in a lot of scalable deep learning, and so we're going to do some integrations that you can um, basically natively support tensors instead of having to use a function to basically convert your data um, from you know, a tensor format to something that can be processed by MLlib um, inside of Scala. Anyway, thanks so much for your attention. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, he said flip back a few slides. Which one? This one? This one? Yeah. Any other questions? Right. Actually, a few questions. So yeah. just to um, be sure, so you have implemented the algorithm yourself. You're not calling an external. Yeah, yeah. So this algorithm is all Scala code right now. So basically, um, the convolutional layer is uh, actually being like run inside of Spark. Um, you have all of the transformations being done on the data. There's no library call. Okay. Um, it's all in Breeze. So if you uh, basically look at the code, there are a lot of Breeze dense matrix multiplies. And we ended up representing convolution as matrix multiplication. The like deltas and the gradients are being computed inside of MLlib. That is, um, you know, all of the like backprop computations uh, are being computed directly. All right. Right now, um, have you implemented um, strides or padding? Yeah. So there are strides and padding. So like, if you look at the API, there's um, a number of um, calls. Yeah. So to convolution and to max pooling. Um, those are the like stride and padding, and so I guess I haven't written stride and padding equals you know thing because the, the thing blows up very quickly as you can imagine. But um, right. this is where you call it. Okay. Um, so given that right now you don't have GPU support, would you save things like ResNets? We have to wait for that. Yeah. Um, so maintain. residual learning is like very close to the top of the agenda because if you want to get state of the art performance, you're going to need to use it. Um, so that's next on our implementation uh, roadmap. There's um, GPU acceleration in the works as well, but I'm going to have to wait in that um, the implementations will like take a decent bit of time to complete at speed that we're happy to put in. So like, like I have a toy model of ResNet working, but it's um, right. going to need to be sped up in order to actually put it in. Okay. Last one. It's a general one, nothing specific to deep learning, but um, give a good presentation so maybe you can explain, uh, give me a good answer for this. What is the logic that is generally used that using stochastic gradient, the local minimum is going to be the global minimum. Uh, so there's some really nice theoretical work showing that the local minimum that you arrive to using stochastic gradient descent are actually um, like provably close to like a lot of other local minimum that get um, like what is close to a global optimum. So in practice, we do really well. Um, you can look at the surface. So when you're doing stochastic gradient descent, you can see. Um, like, you know, how quickly is this going down and, you know, where are my parameters moving? Um, and you can sort of look at the surface and see whether you're on, like, a long plane or, like, if you're dipping um, and use techniques to, like, guarantee to get to the bottom of that. But um, there's, there's, there's some nice theoretical work. So back on your question, there's some nice theoretical work on how close it is to the global optimum. And the advanced optimizers that I showed you actually okay. are doing, uh, doing a lot of dealing with the problem of making sure that you get to a nice local optimum. So your code right now has that capability to see weights uh, as a function of time when you train it? Um, so, sorry, the weights as a function of, like, the yeah, parameters? Yeah, the weights change in uh, Yeah, so I guess um, the, like, public API only exposes the layers, but internally, like, um, so basically you'll have this model class, um, and if you, like, call model.weights, you can see what the weights are. And if you like create a Scala array and that each iteration like push the weights into you know a space, then you can visualize them over time. 
Um, but those aren't likely to be publicly supported because that can change, and there are a lot of good reasons for that to change. Like the current implementation needs you to be able to manip manipulate the gradient very efficiently. So like for almost all of those optimizers, you want to do operations directly on the gradient. Like it will be multiplying the gradient by a number or like dividing it by like a body of previous gradients. And so everything is represented as a large matrix inside of Spark. Um, and so you can access all of those internally. So if you like, you know, go to the GitHub repo, um, clone it, and um, just switch like private to public, then you can like run with that if you like. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah that's it. A great, great presentation. Um, so you talked about having, looking at the best presentation for the uh, features. Like how, if there's a good process to find this presentation, like the example that you mentioned about if not even hard coding the word, but looking at the context of the word. Yeah. Like if there's a good process to come up with this presentation and how can you make sure that you, when you, the sixth question is, how can you make sure that when you have this presentation, you'd be able to interpret it in the network in the right way. Yeah, so um, our ability to find the representations consistently comes before our ability to understand the representations. So Zeller Fergus came out with this uh, like visualization of the like computer vision networks representation years after, like some 15 years after the actual algorithm came out, um, which would have had those representations internally, but we had no way to understand them or visualize them before that. Um, with the word vectors, it's actually a really good example of how like a little bit of creativity with your input and outputs leads to a really fantastic solution for natural language processing. But um, it's not like we have a reliable way for like generating like good representations. Like basically um, a number of people had a few creative ideas and realized that if you like put the context as, um, as the input and put the word as the output, that you generate an internal representation for the word that's like really high quality. And it so happened to work and now we have you know, lots of metaphors that you can look at. But almost always the understanding comes afterwards and we certainly don't have a generative algorithm. And if, if you did, you could go do a lot of great research in the space. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think that's the last question though. I'm sorry for that. I, I, we can talk offline though, that's fine. Um, that's the last question. That was the last question, sorry. Yeah. So we're um, hey, thanks so much for your attention, guys. <laughs>